adopt the facilities, um, the adoption of the facilities partnership policy. Now I will take this as read. There's been a huge amount of work that's gone into this and it's been exceedingly well received. We've got all the feedback, um, the huge feedback report in here. So I'll just ask if there are any questions. A question, please. Oh, yes, Councillor Simpson. Do you want to ask it again? I can do, but uh, did you hear it? I just After you, Madam Chair, I think it was saying uh, what the anticipated cost of the lead relationship broker role. Was yep. that the question? The implementation of this policy is, hinder, is not hinders, is... Um, hinges. Hinges. <laughs> hinges. Hinges on, the, on the, that role. So what is that role going to cost? Uh, so through you, Madam Chair, um, the next phase of work will be looking at implementation about how this actually hits the ground. What we do know is that we already have a number of staff across a number of different departments who are already actually in contact with partners, providing support to partners, providing technical advice. The main issue is at the moment there is no named person accountable to actually hold a relationship with partners over time. So I think what we're doing with this really is saying this is not about recruiting a whole army of new people. It's about acknowledging we already have people who are providing the support but in a way that's disconnected where there's not, it's not clear who's actually holding that accountability. The group isn't clear if they've got an issue, who they pick up the phone and ask to help them navigate um, through that. One thing that we signalled I think last time we came was that if we say this lead relationship broker is a specific role or it's going to be the strategic brokers or the, the local board brokers, that's not necessarily going to be the right person in each case. We may have a, a, an arts and culture partnership where actually someone sitting in the arts and culture team is going to be the right person to be the lead relationship broker. In another case, it may well be someone who's sitting at local board level. So we're not seeing these necessarily as being a whole you know, phalanx of new positions. It's about saying somebody in the organisation, the right person with the most useful expertise, needs to be named and be <coughs> accountable for holding that relationship over time. And before we even get to the point of entering partnership, to be leading the coordination of the advice that's coming backwards and forwards between the partners, the staff, the elected members who are making those decisions. Having said that, this is a new way of working. It may prove more resource intensive, but as I say, the work that we're going to be doing in the next phase will unpack what is actually involved in terms of new processes. If, there, if it is found that there is a, um, a deficit in terms of the number of FTEs or hours that we have or need to be a slight rebalancing, then a, a business case will be brought back to this committee to actually outline why we think that's the case, what we think would be needed to, to bridge that gap. But at this stage, we're saying we anticipate this can be delivered within existing baselines. We have a lot of staff who have a lot of experience in this space already. It's more about coordination and being really clear who's going to hold um, the ring. So, Madam Chair, that was my real big question. In adopting the <coughs> policy, it didn't tell you how what resources it needed to be implemented. It just said it needed these people, and yeah. it didn't tell you whether those people existed or whether there were gaps or it needed significant budget to be added to it. So I was concerned about um, supporting this without that information. Now, can I just confirm that you said that this can, can be delivered within existing budgets, within exi you don't know exactly whom, yeah. But it can be, because I think that's a vital piece. I mean, you know, you don't ad ad yeah. adopt a policy only to f with that without something, someone telling you it's going to cost a whole lot of extra we'll money get, to actually we'll get cut in Remembering, Councillor, though, that thanks to the Mayor's budget, we put $120 million extra into this yeah. to do yes, this. Yes, but that's, I would have said that was to be actually to, to yeah, do right. something, not to, you know, to actually oh. deliver. No. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully it's $120 million to deliver. Yeah. Pat. Just to clarify, so all this work around partnerships exists and goes on already. Mm -hmm. So Dean gets contacted, I get contacted, Liz, Mace, our staff, they come in from all sorts of different sources. You yourself, Councillor Simpson, often contact us, as does local boards. We have people like Lee Redshaw, who you have worked for, who works full time on partnerships all the time. We all assess um, partnerships together. The problem is it's ad hoc and fragmented, so actually if you asked us how much time is that taking, mm -hmm. it is really difficult to put a figure on it. So what this will propose is there's no more work, it'll just be coherent in a single place. We'll be able to actually identify how much staff 
and council resources going into it and we'll hopefully be able to get actually efficiencies because mm -hmm. we're not sometimes people are yeah contacting three or four people at a time but we do we have heard from communities that once we've got a relationship around a facility partnership someone needs to hold that and so for example with um, OFC in your area Lee Redshaw was the partner who ho held that relationship so for lots of partnerships it might be Lee um, or other staff mm -hmm. so we're not actually at this point anticipating new resource we are anticipating that um, resource will have to come together in a more coordinated way and for some people it'll look like it's more because now we can actually identify it Right, and last question, comment to Councillor Walker. Yeah, um, so I've got um, a number of concerns when I read the, um, when I read the policy in it not being sufficiently enabling and in some respects not realistic of um, some of the circumstances that exist. So. Uh, for example, there's an issue around sustainability and maybe financial sustainability. But a particular organisation out there might be relying on grants to achieve something. And the availability of that grant is not going to be known until that organisation goes through some hoops. So on the face of it, that organisation might not appear to be sustainable or even financially viable. There may be large organisations that may not be able to um, adequately fund their depreciation. Let's take Eden Park. No, let's... Um, Councillor, uh, just I'm as an example. Just, just, just hang on, but sorry. It might, I, but it may well be worthy I'm of... I'm just trying to get your question. So my, my question is, when I actually go through this yep. and I apply some tests, and I look at a variety of organisations, I can see that all sorts of things are going to fail. Yep. There are instances increasingly where things around sport and recreation are going into mixed-use models, where you might have um, apartment space. The, if we look at our own organisation, libraries and other things, <coughs> we're increasingly applying a mixed-use model. Yeah. But if I look at this, those things are counted out, uh, where it says here, we won't invest in facility partnerships that have split ownership of the facility, uh, where council own, might own one level and, or, or partner or the like, and there's something else going, going on elsewhere. But the reality is for lots of clubs and societies and, and the like, and I'm, I'm thinking of clubs that might have bars or they might have other things to generate an income, that that's a reality that's out there in the, in the marketplace. And it's a reality and, and a mixed-use reality that we're applying. So my, my question is, is around the opportunity to modify some of these um, policies where they actually rule <coughs> some things out. A and I've just dealt with a couple of examples. There are a number of others. So through Madam Chair, would no. you like me to just address no, those? No, I'm, I'm now just, I am, I've undertaken to do my best to get to the three o'clock meeting. We are now, I think, Mr Mayor, the meeting will need to be 3.30 if you can advise the people who are involved. Um, Councillor, I think what I'm going to suggest is that the adoption doesn't rule out the fact that this is a living document mm -hmm. and we are, and we have the funding for the brokers and working through partnerships. If it appears that there is an issue that arises where there's a fundamental flaw, then we need to deal with it. So, let so that's you know, pretty easy? I think it will be uh, what easy? one would expect from a process like this. You know, there's no point in setting things in cement if they don't work. So your point's well okay, made. Okay, that's great. I because think you're safe. For me, this is a bit like the, like our issue with the churches. Yeah. We thought we had something, but when we actually went out and tested it and we got the feedback, it was fundamentally flawed. Okay. And so we, we've we, tested. Okay. We've heard. We're going to give it a crack, and we're going to fix it if it comes. Now, I am very keen, yep, Councillor so Newman, very you. quickly. So can I just get clarification? How does this relate to facilities that are currently 
uh, where the ownership falls with a trust, but it will eventually come back to us. And I refer, of co course, to the Bruce Bourne Park <coughs> sub-regional facility. So if I could just clarify what the, what the question was in terms of when they come to an end, the facility is owned by someone else and the, la the land is owned by council? I'm not, familiar, I'm, I'm not aware if you're familiar with this. I don't think you are, but you've got a massive sub-regional facility which is currently uh, established by virtue of a deed uh, where the ownership sits currently with the trust, but it will eventually come back to us once the master plan has been complete. So where do they sit in terms of your investment strategy? Do they qualify or are they excluded? Um, so through Madam Chair, this is about new partnerships going forward. Should existing partnerships reach the end of their, you know, their term, be looking to renegotiate, expand or continue, they would come through this process and be tested in the ways that we've outlined you here. You have to question whether, in fact, the, the, the partnership is, is in a good space for that particular facility. So yeah. I don't know if Katarina or Mace are able to give me clarification on that. I think we might take that offline. I think sure. it's clear that this is about new partnerships. I'm going to move the recommendation. Is there a seconder yep. for this? Yep. No. Oh, hang on. I, I kind of don't know where Alf is, but I can Sorry. see the Deputy Mayor. <laughs> so I think the Deputy <coughs> Mayor can second. More visible Sorry, Councillor <laughs> Filipina. <laughs> or Councillor Filipina can move, Deputy <laughs> Mayor can second. I'll put that. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against, thank carried. You. Thank you. And thank I, you for I the questions. This is. You're abstain. abstain on that, because I, I need to. You, and that's yeah. fair, Councillor Newman, because yeah. you need <coughs> to get your question clarified. <laughs> I think we just need to get a little bit more information for you on that, so I'm your extension will be noted. I'm going to... We've got I'm happy to abstain too, Madam Chair. Are I'll, you? I'll join Councillor Newman. I've got OK, that's good. 